Few composers lived life at a higher pitch of passionate creative intensity than Johannes Brahms. There's a reason that we tend to think of this composer in terms of his relationships with family, with friends, with his great mentor Robert Schumann, and above all with Schumann's wife Clara, who Brahms soon told, I love you more than myself, and more than anybody and anything on earth. That was from a letter that Johannes Brahms wrote to Clara Schumann in 1874, two years before the premiere of his first symphony. Just what was the nature of this unique relationship? An older woman, a younger man, two genius artists, both devoted to the memory of another? Is there something in the music of Brahms and in the leader of Clara that might reveal the truth? The first symphony of Johannes Brahms begins with a C minor ostinato, creating tension with each note played in tenuto. The Volkslied, set to words by Heinrich Heine, from Clara Schumann's second book of Lieder, has the same adagio ostinato character. How intriguing an idea that the symphony, which took Brahms 14 years to complete, might have been inspired at its genesis in 1854 by the 1840 song by Clara. Had Brahms already a member of the Schumann circle heard these songs? And if so, might they have served as the seed of his first movement theme? of the disc. Sie liebten sich beide, 
poem by Heinrich Heine. In the original version, sung by the baritone Wolfgang Holzmeier, as if by Brahms himself, is a tragic prophecy of their unconsummated relationship. They once loved each other, but none to the other confessed. Therefore, to hear again, this time in the voice of the anima, the revised version of Sie liebten sich beide, one hears perhaps now the resolved dialogue between these two lovers. For this mature Clara, the voice of this anima, the feminine essence, is manifest in the incomparable Dame Felicity Lot. Brahms's life, he met his muse. In 1853, the same year, Clara set music to Goethe's Das Weilchen, the violet. And one year before Robert Schumann's attempted suicide. The words are a romantic expression of a lonely but proud violet flower whose only desire is to be plucked by a beautiful maiden. Instead, she tramples on him. Yet he is content, saying, I am dying now, but dying thus through her, through her and at her feet I die. Indeed, Brahms himself, trampled by a life without fully having his love, died one year after Clara, probably from cancer, but as I said, more likely from being unwilling to live a life without her. Only in death could he finally have what he could not possess in life. The famous melody of the third movement of the third symphony expresses so clearly this nostalgia, this longing and memory of love eternal. For Brahms, it was all looking backwards at this point, the love they once lived. Beim Abschied, that memory, is inspired by the thought that they will meet again, perhaps in heaven, perhaps not, but romantically, as the finale of Brahms's third symphony ends in pianissimo, we see the two lovers, the lover and the beloved, hand in hand, at last, together, perhaps exchanging the final words from one of the leader 
beim Abschied, words that give an even better idea of the connection with this third symphony. Noch eine Grüße, auf Wiedersehen. Es ist kein Abschied, es ist kein Abschied, kein Vergehen. Yet a wish to meet again, tis no parting, no farewell. I think any conductor wanting to record for a repertoire such as Brahms symphonies would consider it a daunting task, I mean, especially as the market has changed so much since the days of Karajan and Bernstein, and, and not to mention the many other conductors who have recorded Brahms symphonies. However, the repertoire is organic. It lives by the breath of the musicians who play it. It must never exist only in a vacuum or as a recorded museum piece. Brahms, like Beethoven, Mozart, or Mahler, and any other great composer, is universal and timeless. Perhaps those conductors who knew Brahms understood the style of the music as performed according to the conditions and limitations of his time. But music is not limited to time. It exists for all time. And depending upon the evolution of the instrument of the orchestra, so too can an interpretation change. Think about how Brahms loved working with the Meiningen Ensemble when he wrote, Von Bülow must know that the smallest rehearsal in the smallest Meiningen Hall is more important to me than any Paris or London concert. And how good and comfortable I feel amidst the orchestra. I could sing aloud a long song of praise about it. Well, so can I. I feel good with my orchestra. And the way they play shows me they not only understand the tradition and Germanic style of playing Brahms, but with the Grammy-winning team of producer Michael Fine and engineer Wolf-Dieter Kawatki guiding the process, together we can offer something innovative, something fresh, that bit of sunshine that even Brahms preferred on his trips to Italy. That's Brahms con amore. <laughs> ¶¶ 